motion down there. Uh, so far, uh, they are signed up to by governments. We have Nash Act points that look. I want to, in these introductory remarks, um, not focus uh, very tightly on the food chain and small producers because, frankly, there's a lot of experts about this that I want to learn from rather than uh, speak to on that issue. But I think it's relevant at the beginning of today's um, provocation, what a wonderful word, uh, to just say a little bit about the wider context from the strand of this that I'm coming from, corporate social responsibility and accountability, why it clearly is a development issue, uh, some of the approaches on that that we've um, uh, engaged in, some good examples uh, which have involved empowerment in the South, uh, and some pleas to you about part of the follow-up I'd like you to, to, to um, engage with as part of the follow-up to all of these different symposia. Um, so point one, we meet at an exciting time. Uh, if you're a, a corporate social responsibility and accountability nut, as I am, uh, itching away at this issue over a large number of years, we really are in a different position than we were five or ten let alone 15 years ago. So Europe's multi-stakeholder forum, uh, which in the past, and my friend and colleague Dwight Justice over there has been sitting there watching it and taking part in it along with me. I propose setting this up now over 10 years ago. Uh, and it has been a bit of a battleground where companies have sometimes tried to limit uh, what their ambitions are. In a way, actually not at all relevant representative of companies themselves, European companies themselves, the associations in Brussels have been stuck in a mindset which is a very defensive one, which doesn't actually reflect their own members in my view, let alone other stakeholder groups. But uh, over the last two years, and culminating in a meeting where we had, I think, 2,000 people uh, uh, it, just before Christmas, there definitely is a different mindset now. I'm not saying that there aren't key and difficult issues to deal with, but there is a mindset to say that businesses now accept greater responsibility. Many of them would say they propose it and initiate it, um, and that the European Union and its institutions have got a much more open and constructive mind to how we add value and further and uh, incentivise and promote uh, all of that. So there's a much more constructive attitude going on at the European Union level on these corporate responsibility issues. Secondly, within the last month, we've seen the agreement of the uprated OECD guidelines on multinational enterprise. In my view, they are the most authoritative international standard on corporate responsibility. Uh, Royal Neuvenkamp from the Netherlands chaired that process. He's a personal friend and colleague of mine, and he and all of them have done, in my view, a brilliant job. Uh, and uh, the key about the OECD guidelines is that they uh, are in that soft law area. People say they're voluntary, but in that soft law area, they are signed up to by governments. We have national contact points that look at complaints and adjudicate on them, mediate and adjudicate on them, and are extremely relevant to business practice in developing countries, including a third of signatories to the guidelines who are not OECD members. You know, the big criticism of that could be it's a rich man's club, deliberately said man. Uh, but in reality, countries uh, throughout Latin America and Asia, less Africa at the moment, uh, have also been signing up. And I'd like to see more, by the way, and I think that should be part of our, our plan. Then, uh, in the last two weeks, with the official agreement last week, John Ruggie's Framework for Business and Human Rights in the UN Human Rights Council was passed. Uh, and... I cannot tell you how that has changed the weather on corporate responsibility issues internationally because in the UN Human Rights Council we have seen unanimous agreement and support for the fact that businesses must and can do much better with respect to human rights. They can't just say it, they have to do it and they have to demonstrate it through his concept of due diligence and it's very important to say that the international chambers of commerce the international organization of employers let alone all of the member states of the un human rights council are all signed up to that and not reluctantly a few years ago you might remember there was a whole debate over the over guidelines on business and human rights through the subcommittee that was very polarized and there's a lot of disagreement 
add five, six years on, and we're in a different place internationally, uh, and that's extreme, been extremely important. We then, last Friday, here in Brussels, had the latest in a set of global roundtables that we've been organising on behalf of something called the International Integrated Reporting Committee. Right, I'm going to ask, who's heard of that? Put your hand up. Right, fewer people, fewer people than the private enterprise people in the room. Uh, and it's the least sexy title <laughs> for the most sexy thing, right? Which is the idea that businesses incorporate social, environment and human rights reporting in their financial reporting in an integrated fashion. And we're going to do it as a world by 2020. And the major social and environmental auditing uh, world bodies, the Global Reporting Initiative, and uh, if I can be British for a moment, uh, the Prince of Wales Accounting for Sustainability project, uh, have, uh, together with the major accountancy bodies worldwide, advanced this process. We're hoping it will be endorsed at the G20 in October, and that's something I'm personally working on. Uh, a consultation will be opened within a month or so on this. Uh, and uh, so, again, it's a really exciting moment in terms of bringing uh, social, environmental and human rights performance of companies together with financial performance for the first genuine time. And then again, here in the European Union, w in September of this year, the European Commission are due to publish a communication to set forth the next stage in terms of where we want to go at a European Union level. And I'm very grateful to them. Uh, 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 and I'm influencing that process and look forward to that publication. And I believe that there are going to be some very good and interesting steps there, including on the issue of disclosure. So, uh, exciting times. Point two, this is a development issue. If you want to know what motivates me and my work over 15 years and what is a guiding principle for me, I am not interested in Europe just doing the right thing within the European boundaries because the European Parliament represents the citizens of Europe and what the citizens of Europe are most worried about in terms of corporate performance and lack of corporate responsibility are sweatshops in developing countries, export processing zones in developing countries where labour standards are routinely, sometimes legally, uh, ignored. They're worried about mining and extractive projects. Uh, they're worried uh, about palm oil plantations and that is perhaps the most relevant thing for this meeting where companies often from Europe uh, have been involved in major projects that they say is improving the prosperity in the developing country but in reality is actually a negative one as far as smallholders, peasant farmers, local communities, indigenous communities are concerned. All they're worried about human rights abuses, whether it be in conflict zones with private security firms who are supposedly protecting staff actually being complicit in human rights abuses, or host country agreements whereby major multinationals have come in and said to governments of developing countries, you have to waive your right to regulate us, even to monitor our compliance with human rights, or we, we won't give you the investment. Utterly outrageous that that takes place. Uh, and those are the things that European citizens are worried about. And I'm not saying all companies do them. And I'm not saying that it's the standard. Uh, but I am saying that if we are to deal with issues of corporate responsibility, those are the ones we should worry about. Uh, and therefore, in my work, I have championed, starting off with a series of hearings that we held on the impact of European companies in developing countries in the development committee of this parliament, I've championed looking at the responsibility of European corporations in developing countries as the first test of whether our policies are really making a difference. Uh, and, uh, um, uh, uh, and have championed as well the idea that we are not interested in a sort of Europe-only solution on CSR. We are interested in global solutions and how Europe can properly participate in those and apply them within our own boundaries. So that's point two. Point three, you're all aware of this because you're a specialist in the field, but there have been a series of specific issues around development and corporate responsibility that we've dealt with, uh, which show you know, that we're not starting from zero. Um, the whole anti-corruption thing is absolutely crucial. 
because as you understand, and we need the wider community to understand, that if we're worried about development, we have to be worried about good governance in the governments of developing countries. And if we're worried about good governance in the governments of developing countries, we have to be worried about how good governance and anti-corruption by business, their own business, but our business working with their own business, working with their governments, can actually promote that good governance. And it's, you know, the people who are anti-corruption have been sort of banging on for years about this, and who shouldn't be anti-corruption? But, but I think now there is a much greater understanding that this is a development issue. Right? This isn't just a fairness or moral issue or justice issue. It's also a development issue because it's holding back developing countries in the development process. All the whole issues of transfer pricing and the payment of fair tax by companies, which is a crucial issue, and it remains on the table. And the whole publish what you pay campaign, absolutely brilliant in my view. Uh, and uh, the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, which is linked to that. Uh, and it does show how the world is changing on corporate responsibility, because for many times companies would say this is commercially sensitive and we can't say it, but now they do. And it is sh shown to be possible. And I'm not saying it's perfect, but it, we have definitely moved forward. Similarly, the Kimberley process on conflict diamonds and I think the whole issues around conflict, minerals, mm -hmm. coal town in the Democratic Republic of Congo, again, is a key test for whether we make a difference. And it was for John Ruggie uh, as well. Whole issues around investment. I'm on the advisory board for the UN Principles Responsible Investment. But if we want to change uh, uh, what you want to change, the power of investment to do that is huge. It's, you know, we've got a responsibility from the world of regulation and government and legislation, I accept that. But there's also a huge potential through investment. Uh, and again, UNPI, far from perfect, but the rules of the international financial institutions are rather different now than they were a few years ago. But are they properly being applied? I hope you'll discuss that today. Uh, and finally, in terms of these themes, the supply chain issue. For a long time, companies said we could only be responsible for ourselves and then drew a very tight line around what they called themselves, which is their head office and the administrative staff didn't even include the, the cleaners and the caterers, by the way, in their head office, let alone what they were doing in Zimbabwe or Botswana or Papua New Guinea. And the great thing that Ruggie has done and in the OECD guidelines is we've nailed that argument on the Ruggie work what he says, it's you have to measure the human rights impact. So it's where you have most impact. And that clearly is not in the lift on the way up to the managing director's office. And what the OECD guideline says, they get rid of this invest, uh, investment nexus, so it's only around the direct investment. It, again, has to be the supply chain. I'm not saying it's easy, but again, we've moved a long way on from where we are. Uh, time's running. Uh, a lot of that is very conceptual, and I just want to say, especially for the audience that are watching on video across the south of the world, mm -hmm. it really does mean something to us, and we want it to mean something to you. So, for example, in the multi-stakeholder forum, we've had companies that are working in Africa, talking through what it's like to have a workforce riven with HIV AIDS, and knowing that the average tenure of people in the workforce is 500, 600, 7% turnover because of that, knowing that the problems of AIDS orphans are problems of the company because they're problems of its employees and working through those issues about how you be a responsible employer in Africa because of it. Or we know, I just pay respect that UNRISD is part, one of the partners today. UNDP is one of the key partners that has helped us push out corporate responsibility policies across Eastern and now Southeastern Europe and is a key agency in terms of developing this at the world level. Or the Ethical Trading Initiative from my own country that has looked, for example, at the wine industry in South Africa and has started to actually say we can pay more we can pay more and consumers can pay more and companies can pay more as long as we can see what we get back. And of course, that's a fundamental tenet of the fair trade movement, which many of us are supporters of. 
So I hope those words are meaningful to you. And I, what I, you're going to look in detail at some of these issues around small business and uh, uh, um, peasant farmers and ownerships in developing countries. But what I appeal to you is to, in doing that, bring those lessons back into these wider debates, into my work, the work of the European Union, and into these wider debates, and help us deliver what you want to deliver through these mechanisms, because these mechanisms are there, and they're working, and they're relevant, and we need you to be engaging in those processes as much as I hope you may need us to deliver what we do. Thank you very much.